you don't have to jump from never having done any of that all the way to product information management systems, content management systems, uh, you know, e-com systems and multi-channels and marketplaces. And right, you don't need to go that far. You can take this step by step. You know, you don't need to bring in 15 unless unless your business really, really uh, needs that for some technical reason. But it's not often the case, even in the most complex. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. Furniture industry is extremely unique as while its distribution processes might be similar to other distribution industries, each product is custom made. And this makes implementing e-commerce for furniture manufacturers, extremely challenging. The manufacturers also need to make sure that there is no channel conflict and their retailers are comfortable with their intention of going DTC and e-commerce. If communicated properly, the e-commerce efforts not only help in getting more business, it might increase the loyalty of their channels as they'll be getting more business through OEMs e-commerce efforts. In today's episode, our guest Robert Giovini shares his insights into the e-commerce nuances for furniture manufacturers. He also discusses the cyclical nature of e-commerce processes for furniture manufacturers where the OEMs might generate the lead for retailers. But once they book the order, the transaction might need to come back to the manufacturer for fulfillment. Finally, he discusses other issues with e-commerce such as ADA compliant and how e-commerce brands might get penalized if their websites might not be compliant with ADA regulations. Let me introduce Robert to you. Robert is the CEO of Iron Plane, a full-service e-commerce agency specializing in platform design, development, and digital marketing. He brings 20 plus years of e-commerce website development, and team leadership experience to his role at Iron Plane. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Robert. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. Amazing, and I'm super pumped to have you here as well. The kind of insights you are going to have related to e-commerce for furniture manufacturers, it's going to be so fascinating for our listeners. Just to kick things off, Robert, do you want to start with your personal story and current focus? Love it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, it's a, it's kind of an interesting story. Well, I find it interesting. I Back in 96, I was in Russia and I came across these chess sets, Sam. And uh, son of a gun, I, I said, well, you know, e-commerce is doing something. I, I got to right. learn about this. So I got on, I found this tool called Front Page, which I think was the, all the rage for building an e-com site and right. started dragging and dropping, wired up PayPal, took some awful photos and put this chess set up online. And do you know what? A week later, the ski slope in Vancouver, sight unseen, spent 10 grand and nine, 10 grand, somewhere there, you yeah, know, yeah. to buy the chess set sight unseen. And I'm like, huh, there, there's something to e-com. You wow. know, this is, this is, yeah. this is going to be, you know, I got to get in this thing. Right. And so yeah. uh, I started buying and selling products and then you know, I'd send containers to my then girlfriend, now wife's uh, garage. You know, yeah. we started buying, you know, selling things online and I got really deep into this. And then over the years, I, the journey took me in an unexpected turns and people started asking me to build sites. Yeah. And, and that was, that was sort of the genesis of iron plane. What, what we are today, which is, yeah. you know, e-commerce website development agency. And we just kind of come at it from this perspective of business first. Yeah. And, and mostly because I'm not a coder and a developer. I mean, so yeah. I, I have to pick up business first. And, and then I hire a lot of smart folks on my team that really can then take all these great ideas and turn them into reality. And so right. this is where, you know, Iron Plane has, uh, has made its, its stake and we have a lot of fun with this. Uh, 
in helping other companies, and particularly these days, manufacturers and yep. B2B companies, how do you leverage this? How do you get in there? How do you make it happen so that you know, you're not destroying your markets, but you're also yep. you're growing new markets, you're not doing channel conflict? Uh, how do you work this in? And so that's where we are. Yeah, perfect. And I like the way you have put it. In fact, I mean, see if I remember, e-com has been there for a very long time. But if you look at the <laughs> state of e-commerce at this point of time, especially if you are going to talk about manufacturers, they are yeah. really behind. We are in 2022 and they are really behind. In, in They're just very business. busy. They're very, very busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that. But before we do that, we have one of the standard questions that we ask every single guest, Robert. And that is going okay. to be your perspective on business growth. Huh. Uh, boy, you know, every day, right? It's a different story, right? You know, is the economy yeah. going up, down? Is inflation going to kill our growth? Are we headed to a recession, a minor recession? My... I think when we're talking e-commerce, uh, the perspective is only to go up. Uh, as the world continues to get more complicated, we got to make it easier for people to buy things. They want to yeah. buy things easier. And e-com is just a great place uh, for a company to leverage that. Now, the exact way that looks for us in this industry, that's always a changing, evolving thing, right? And yeah. so uh, I, was, I was told the other day, I got to be at, my company's got to be at TikTok. I'm like, ha ah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know? I'm like, really, really, do we think that's really where I gotta be? And I, 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 I'm still not totally convinced. But you know, there's definitely people on my team that are going. You're definitely need to here. be on TikTok. It's so hot. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You know. And so now I'm thinking, all right, I'm gonna go talk to my manufacturer of, you know, of this bolt and say, you know, you gotta get this bolt on TikTok. Link, link, link. I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> but you know, uh, you know. But in any event, you, you know, the reality is, uh, I think that. I think that the outlook is good. I think we're going to see maybe more shifts up and down right. faster, right? And it's going to be a little more reactionary. We've always got issues with supply chain. Those are going to get even more complicated. It seems like labor is difficult. I mean, yeah. every input is, is difficult. But I think there's, I think the consumer confidence is still strong and yeah. people still have uh, this, you know, discretionary income and yeah. unemployment is extremely low. So I think the outlook is, is pretty good. Yeah, I completely agree. Outlook is definitely good. And, uh, you know, from your assessment perspective, I think the e-commerce is great, but it has to make sense for the business as well. And I yeah. am going back to your comment that business has to come first. E-com is the enabler and wherever it makes sense. I mean, there are a lot of businesses that should be doing e-commerce, but they are not doing. And there are yeah. businesses that should not be yeah. doing e-commerce because if there's too much technology, probably, you know, they might not get benefited by e-commerce, but one of the things that e-commerce provides that I personally like is going to be the traceability and the data that you are going to get because of the digital capabilities that you are not going to have in your traditional world. So that's where I see a lot of potential. So let's go back yeah. to your uh, background when you work with, let's say, the furniture manufacturers, and that's a very different piece altogether. It's a very different industry the way it operates, yeah. the kind of you know products it serves. So do you want to pick on the story that you had about the furniture manufacturer? What was their business model? What was their core challenges? Um, you know, when they sort of started thinking about e-commerce, I'm pretty sure they were doing traditional business before, but then they sort of got the bug of e-commerce and they wanted to try it. So tell me a little bit about their business model and the core challenges that they had before they engaged. With yeah, so for, you, you hit it on the head. Furniture is a unique beast because you've got companies that, rely solely on importing uh, and and that creates inventory challenges and yeah. back order challenges and and the whole pipeline just uh, suffers right yeah. but then you've also got domestic manufacturers of product and yeah. so I uh, and there's fewer of those of course but uh, they've got their own unique challenges of raw material procurement and right. and making sure that and and labor and all those inputs we talked about earlier. Yeah. So uh, we've worked with a lot of different furniture companies over the years, uh, and on both sides of that equation, uh, where they're you know they're designing and building overseas, and others yeah. that are uh, designing and building here in the U.S. And one of my favorite stories is Gat Creek, uh, which on Ironplane.com you can see it as a is a large case study. We also got a video showing their yeah. factory tour, all this stuff. Yeah. I love it because. These guys are domestic, uh, established uh, furniture maker, uh, yeah. of incredible furniture. And their model, like most furniture manufacturers, was to sell through uh, distributors and retailers. I mean, yeah. furniture, big retail stores, right? And so where you go in, you see a sample of the product, you order, and you wait eight to 12 weeks for it to be manufactured, and, and it comes. Yeah. And I remember talking with their VP of marketing uh, quite some time ago, uh, and 
he said, you know, there's just this opportunity. It's not like we have a a retailer in every corner or every city. Yeah. And there's just, you know, there's there's vast swaths of the country where we don't serve. Right. And he goes, but I, I also don't want to offend, ruin, uh, disrupt yeah. my well-established, exactly. loyal distribution channels, right? Yep. So yep. we sat down and started to map out. I mean, so this is just one example where we said, all right, well, what can we do to use your e-commerce site yeah. to empower your distributors yeah. as well as perhaps serving other markets where they don't exist? Right. And so this was this was what led to uh, the current version of GatCreek.com, where when you go on there, depending on where you are in the country, yeah, you are going to the order is going to automatically flow to a local partner, a local distributor, retailer for fulfillment. But if you're in an area that is not served by any of those people, then it's factory direct with all of its resultant margins to the factory. Yeah. So this is great because you've now raised up both the retailer. Yeah. You've established more credibility with them that you actually have their best interest at heart, but you're right. also extending your brand in areas where retailers don't exist. And so, so that in alone, I think for managing channel conflict was a win-win across the entire thing. They also were able to establish price parity in the market, right? right. You know, we're, Hey, you know, we're out here with our MSRP yeah. and, and we're holding that steady. So that yeah. kind of, you know, when the manufacturer is doing this or the, or the, the major distributor is doing this, it flows to the market, right? So now all of a sudden you, you can establish some more, I don't know, price transparency, but also floors on your pricing a little bit more so. Uh, and I think that that's been really impactful. Very, very, very interesting. And I love the way you have uh, broken this down because, you know, when you think about these challenges, when let's say if I think of my customers and when they are thinking about any of the e-commerce efforts, they are obviously going to be frightened because, you know, if you have your branded better, Coming from your distributors, you don't want them to be mad. If they are mad, yeah. then you are not in the business, right? So when you yeah. are going to yeah. be trying new, number one, the communication has to be there. The, the right model has to be there that is going to help everybody. So in your scenario, the way I like it is going to be that in your case, you are literally generating leads for them. You are always going to have yes. far higher brand authority than they are ever going to have because obviously OEMs are probably going to be larger business than the distributors. In some cases, distributors might be larger as well, but that's very rare. Typically, mm -hmm. OEMs are going to have far more capital funds, um, you know, brand authority, you know, um, to serve the market. So I like the way you are generating the lead, but you are also segmenting and making sure the other markets are going to be served and love the pricing equation. It's fantastic. And I'm just, I'm, I mean, and if you're the retailer, and you've got you're representing multiple brands in your store. Who are you going to think about first, right? You're going to be thinking about the OEM that's sending you leads, that's sending, that's, that's building up your business. It's just going to be a natural flow, and exactly. there's going to be a, a greater loyalty there. I, I I just think it's a win win that that works beautifully uh, across all the channels. I completely agree, and 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 so let's break it down a little bit more. So here, yeah. let's say when you are sending these orders to your retailers and distributors, so is this going to be more of the dropship situation? where, you know, these people are sort of, uh, you know, fulfilling the order. So describe the whole order flow. So I think I have your lead flow down that the lead is going to come to the OEM side. The lead goes to my distributor retailer where the areas are going to be, uh, you know, served by them. If the area is not served, then, you know, they are going to go to them that they are doing the self-fulfillment. So describe the order process in both two scenarios and how the invoicing works. Who's paying whom? What kind of order is there? There's a few different ways you can approach this. Yeah, yeah. In this particular circumstance, the quote goes directly to the systems of the retailer. Okay, okay. so when it when it's going to be fulfilled by a local retailer, it's going right into their normal order flow system, right? As if somebody maybe came onto their website and ordered. Right. If that's even possible. Most right. don't even most don't have that facility. And then they're going to call and they have a responsibility and the good partners do this to call that customer right away and start setting up the next steps here, get the payment yeah. information and then figure out the logistics and white glove or not and all that good yeah. stuff. And then it go, the order is released to the factory to be fulfilled because that's how furniture is anyway. You're, you're very rarely buying off the shelf. Per right. Se. So, so that's a, and then for the factory direct, it's a much simpler process. I mean, the order is placed directly online, it's paid for online, and it goes straight into the factory. It's released for the factory once the order is approved internally with the customer service, right? And so it's a much more streamlined flow. Yeah. The, the beauty in this is that the OEM can truly see which partners are embracing their brand and are reacting quickly and are fulfilling these orders because that order is going to round trip back to yeah. the factory 
once payment's been confirmed and they know that, you know, hey, did this partner call that customer quickly? Did they get the payment information? Is it is the order now released for production in the factory? Right. And so you, you get this reporting that's yeah. pretty clear across all your partners of how many orders you're sending over, how fast they've been, you know, closed and, and yeah. put back into the factory. So it, it's just great visibility. So, okay. So very interesting. So I am going to build on top of that and you can provide some more information to make sure that my listeners are able to follow along. So here, I'll do my best. You know, okay. <laughs> so here uh, the order flow is going to be, okay, the lead is coming to the OEM site. Then the quote is actually going to the retailer. And you mentioned that yeah. every single quote is probably going to be make to order. And I am not sure if you are familiar with that term, uh, what it means is you are not storing these things in the inventory, uh, if I, my right. understanding is right, right? So, so that's right, because it's furniture. Be, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So okay. this is going to be custom built furniture for yeah. the specific situation, for the specific orders that yeah. they are trying to build. Okay, so who is responsible for building this? Is the retailer or the distributor who's building it or the workflow is going back to the OEM and they are building because retailer has the, the sales cycle, the control of the sales cycle, but then the flow is, is the flow going back to the manufacturer for the so, movement? So if you think about it, right? I yeah. mean, the order is is a quote in the factory's e-com system, okay? okay? So it's like almost like an, it's almost as if the retailer placed a request for quote to the factory, okay? But because it's already, we know all the pricing, it's already auto-generated. So it's, it's kind of a funny thing. The consumer yeah. has, by their choices, generated an RFQ from the retailer to the factory. Now the retailer just needs to contact that customer to finalize payment. Right. And then and then when that and then they're gonna place that order back at the factory, the factory's gonna look and go, oh, we have this RFQ in our econ system. It's paid, Mark paid, it's now released automatically into our ERP for fulfillment. And so it's a it, it round trips that way. And so you get you you know the order that's coming in. It's almost as if you you have a, a let me use this term very incorrectly, but a spyglass yeah. in yeah. the retailer, right? And the customers come in, they've done a quote, they send yeah. it to the factory for pricing. That yeah. all part is now done on the e-com site. So the only piece left now is the retailer has to get the credit card information to process that order right. and and release it for production. And so uh, and so they call back up to the factory and say, okay, we've got this order number. Factory pulls it up. They already have it because it came through their site. Right. And now it's released for production. And so, and the flow goes normally. Very interesting. So obviously there are many different ways of doing things, right? And totally. in this particular yeah, case, yeah, 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 yeah. In this particular case, let, let's analyze this a little bit more because there has to be the inventory that has to be exchanged between the partners. There has to be a product catalog uh, that is being shared between partners, right? And a lot of times, most people don't really understand how to sort of, you know, draw these boxes so that we have the communication back and forth. Because any sales cycle, I mean, for that matter, you know, whether you talk about furniture or anything else, when you are talking about manufacturing, uh, manufacturers and distributors, the relationship is becoming closer and closer. They need right. a lot of collaboration, right? So That's here right. in the traditional world, typically retailer would start the sales cycle because the customer is actually walking in their door and then they are going to send the order to the manufacturer that I have a customer sitting here. He is trustworthy. Yeah. He has already paid. Now he is looking to buy the furniture. Can you send me the furniture? And then you are going to fulfill. And I am actually going to send because I'm local here, right? That's the traditional cycle. Now, in yeah. this particular case, so as you mentioned, there's a little bit of round trip here, right? So there are many yeah. different ways of structuring this. So here, my understanding is going to be they are going to have the ECAM system and they are going to have the ERP system. ERP system is most likely going to be responsible for the fulfillment. Ecom is most likely going to be controlling the sales and marketing workflow, right? So one way could be, and again, you know, you can challenge me on this, right? So I no, 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 to... <laughs> there's so many flavors of this, but this is the right. one that you're talking about right now. Yeah. Right. right. So we are trying to solution on the fly here. So let's say yeah. one way could be that, okay, I have my lead here in my sales and marketing system. I send this lead as the code, as you have mentioned, to the distributor or the retailer. And then I don't even know in my ERP that something happened here, right? That's one way of right. doing it. Or That's right. the second way of doing it is, okay, since I am the, the order generator, so my ERP needs to know that. Typically, ERP systems, uh, you know, some companies like to keep them. Some companies like to keep only the orders in the ERP system because it could become very crowded, uh, you know, sometimes. But if you yeah. are doing yeah. customer 360, then you have a different challenge, then you probably need to keep <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it's all over the place. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So yeah. 
Yeah, do you have any more colors there? Okay, so, well, listen. So I think there's a few different things going there. It, yeah. Again, in this particular circumstance, we're not ta- everything's made to order, right? Thanks, so thanks, thanks. inventory is, if the product is available on the website, it means that they've got the raw materials to fulfill the product, okay? Right. And so, uh, and that's, it's very rare in a furniture situation where you're going to take down a piece of furniture. You're probably just going to increase the lead time to build the furniture, okay? Right. If if you're If you're waiting on more supply or something. So... Uh, so in this case, you're not necessarily having to connect your e- your ecom site to the ERP for live inventory or backup inventory or any of those pieces. And some people do live inventory calls. We have that, or other times you're just building in buffers because you never sell that much online. I mean, there's any number of ways you can you can tackle this. Okay, right, right, right. but in this case, yes, it is your sales and marketing engine. It's your front face, right? That the OEM is doing. The beauty is the OEM is probably doing more more marketing nationwide, and so they're bringing in leads yep. that the individual retailer may never have found because they're doing their social media marketing, they're exactly. doing their paid search, they're doing their SEO. And so somebody is going to find this piece of furniture there, you heard of this brand and it's going to come in and now it's going back to that retailer, right? And so, and that's the round trip that's nice on the sales and marketing. And, and it just, it raises everybody's level. On top of that, the OEM is going to be able to control the messaging around their brand. Right. So in the case of like Gat Creek, which is a great example, they actually, we, we built for them with our partner 3Kit, 3D virtualization, every yep. single finish, wood yep. tone, hardware. Yep. So, you know, you got 4,000 variations on almost any, that's an exaggeration. You got about 800 variations on almost any SKU, okay? Yep. You can't do a sample for all those. And it's, and it's not enough to just take Photoshop and layer on another color. It doesn't look real. Yep. But with 3D virtualization on the fly, with dependent options, this this wood grain can come in these six colors and these two hardwares. This wood yeah. grain come in over here. All of that is automatically presented in a way that a paper catalog can't do or a single showroom piece in in the in the store can do. So now even the retailers can go to the Gat Creek website and pull yeah. up and visualize every aspect of the product. So that's another way that the ecom site is allowing the OEM to control messaging and brand positioning, which I just think is fantastic. Yeah, so very interesting commentary there. And I want you to clarify uh, one thing that you mentioned, you know, related to this whole variation thing and then the 3D visualization of the products. So you mentioned that, you know what, if you're going to have many different variations, it's very hard to replicate there in Photoshop, right? But when I look at the 3D model of any product, they typically are going to rely on some sort of pictures underneath. They Somebody is taking those pictures and feeding it in, into the 3D model, and that's how you are getting that 3D visualization, right? And uh, unless I'm yeah. off here, so no, uh, no, you your initial you got to have something that's right, right? You know, so mm-hmm. usually you're starting, I mean, particularly in this case where it's very complicated 3D modeling, you are going to take those CAD drawings and your initial imagery, you know, of right. one set piece. But almost every OEM has at least one set of good. Well, if they don't, they should get one set of good photography of their core models right across the board and then between those two pieces the cad schematics and the and the and the good baseline imagery you can create uh incredible visualization uh of these products online. okay so very interesting so let's layer uh the inventory uh commentary uh you know on this so you you yeah. mentioned that this is a make to order situation where you don't have to really communicate the live inventory. Okay, you don't have to worry the about the, yeah. the raw material. But now yeah. I am doing my, I'm a customer, okay? I yeah. am doing my 3D visualization. I have 4,000 different variations. I am trying to select, okay, this is the raw material I'm looking for. This is the finish yeah. that I want in my furniture. Okay, this is the code that I am sending to you, right? So yeah. there has to be some communication about the product catalog, the raw material, the variations, the finishes. And these things are going to change. For example, let's say a customer is going to order a variation. Now, that's not available in the market at all. <laughs> so obviously, that's not a good customer experience, right? Because you no. are trying to order something that yeah. is probably not there anymore from the supplier yeah. perspective, from the inventory perspective. Yeah. So how is that typically controlled in the furniture industry with this customer? I don't know if there's a typical, but we see you know, a couple of different variations of this. Generally speaking, when we when we enter into these projects with companies, we're we're looking at let's assume for a minute they've got their core systems in place, their ERP systems are properly set up, they've yeah. got their core you know their product master data, and generally speaking, the ERP is going to be the product of record, the record of the the master record of the product. Okay, yeah. and this is where inventory and or and or raw materials if we're, if we're building up. Uh, inventory from raw material. Sometimes that happens as well for the more complex products. Yep. That's going to drive 
availability on the website and we and we and we link those things so when you're talking about something that's always made to order it's easier i I mean because you can have your flags right you know if this if this raw material is you know running low of particular wood grain right wood type it's fairly easy to flip the bit and and build in your your backup and and shut it down so that somebody can't order that or it goes onto a back order and we can also bring in that data if companies are really tied into their supply chain to know okay we know that this is coming in in eight weeks we can add eight weeks to the time to fulfill there's a lot of ways to do this from the customer experience where i think it gets more complicated is companies that are either a ordering from overseas and yeah. ordering finished product Okay. And so they've got to know well in advance what's happening with their supply chain, how much inventory is coming in, what their typical channels are. And on e-com, you know, again, it could be live inventory feeds, but generally speaking, you, if you're in omni channel and pushing out multiple channels, even that live feed could be incorrect. If you have one manual sale over here, right. That hasn't been entered in manually by the call center or something, who knows. Right. And so what we're, what we typically do is work with the businesses to define what their buffers are, right? So if if this you know if this typical SKU sells at this level yeah. this quickly, these turns, we're on the online channels. We're going to set a buffer that says you know we're going to put this on back order if it falls below a certain quantity. Thank so you. there's safety stock. Essentially, you're you're building on safety stock. Okay. That said, you know we we, we how many times have you ordered on Wayfair? And you yeah. think you've got the product right. And then a week, uh, two days later, they're calling you saying, oh, that was oversold in another channel and we don't have availability of it. You know what I mean? So it's not a perfect world, uh, even for the largest e-commerce sites out there. Yeah. But I think OEMs, where they can, where they have full visibility into their supply chain and as tight as those are, they can build in the proper safety stocks to, to minimize customer disruption. And, and dissatisfaction. Yeah, very interesting. So let's dig a little bit more into that. So you mentioned that, you know what, the ERP needs to be the product master record and the e-com needs to be sort of the consumer of that data, but there are, uh, you know, places for the data set. For example, let's say you talk about product imagery, okay? It's a horrible yeah. idea to store that in the ERP system. <laughs> so, yeah, all right, so let's back way up here. When I say product, I am talking about your costs, yeah, you know your 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 the core core product attributes, right? Yeah. Dimensions, anything that is truly traditional ERP. No photography, unless it's maybe one single image, you know, for yeah. a quick view, right? But no, I think your e-commerce system or your e-commerce system, depending on how big you are, in conjunction with your uh, digital asset him. management yeah. system or yeah. your experience manager, right? Depends on how we define this. But I would start to think about my e-com system as my marketing system, my portal to the outside world for any number of channels. Okay. Yeah. And, and this is where I'm going to store all my descript, you know, my more marketing, my messaging essentially. And so my, my extended product descriptions, my extended specifications, my PDF files, my imagery, my 3d virtualization, anything that is on brand sales and marketing, I'm either going to drive out of the e system or at yeah. least a good portion of that, because I can use that to feed multiple channels or I'm going to drive that out of a PIM, a product information management system to truly go into omni-channel, right? So it depends on how many systems we're bringing into this. But if you're not that complex, relatively speaking, you could even do all this right out of your, your e-com system. Uh, so, I, and I think that's a good starting point for those that have never even explored PIMs or, yep. you know, content management systems and all these things. I think the e-com system is a nice next step uh, to take raw core data from my ERP, build it out. Typically in the way I'd be building out a, a paper catalog, because uh, yep. many still are doing that, right? Or their PDF, get that into a proper e-com system. Now I've got all this marketing material that I can push out in a hundred different ways uh, and control the messaging much more broadly. So yeah, very interesting. And I completely agree that, you know what, the more systems that you are going to introduce in the architecture, the more complex the integration is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, yeah. yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's not a progress. I mean, it really, the complexity goes up, you know, you know exponentially. And so uh, when you start adding in system, for sure. Exactly. But, I mean, it sounds fancy that, you know what, I am going to have my experience management system. I'm going to have my digital asset management, e yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ERP, you name it. And then, you know, 5,000 other tools that you have in the architecture. I find even a company, I mean, it could be a $100 million company, $200 million company. 
or a $1 million a year company. Yeah. The reality is we can off, if you've never been in this or you've only dabbled in starting to get online or you're mostly just about brand and lead generation, if you want to cross that chasm into e-commerce or direct to consumer or using your, your site to collect orders from your distributors, right? It could truly yeah. be a B2B site as well. I still, in my mind, this is still e-commerce. It's electronic commerce, right? It's digital commerce. And so I'm enabling, I'm making it easier for anybody that buys from me, whether it's a, a distributor or a consu- and consumer, I'm just trying to make that process faster and easier and less expensive, right? right, right. So, but you don't have to jump from never having done any of that all the way to product information management systems, content management systems, uh, you know, e-com systems and multi-channels and marketplaces. And right, you don't need to go that far. You can take this step by step. It's good. We like to sit down with clients and think about what their three-year outlook what might look like, because that could drive some initial decisions, but crawl, walk, run. I mean, it still applies. I mean, because you're, you're going to do everything you can just to get wrap your hands around one new system that you've never brought in and a new way of selling and marketing. You know, you don't need to bring in 15 unless, unless your business really, really uh, needs that for some technical reason, but it's not often the case, even in the most complex businesses. Yeah. And know. typically technical reasons are not good reasons uh, to drive the architecture. No. I mean, it no. has to be. No, no. Business, right? I'm a tech company, right? <laughs> I'm a tech company. I'm like, oh, we want to stop. <laughs> the reality is my best clients are where our, we have fallen to the background, right? We, they, like, it just works. And they know that we're there just making the clocks run on time, trains run on time. Bad metaphors. I mix them all the time. But you get the idea. So, you know, this is where I think that, you know, companies quickly, and, and they should, they start talking to all the stakeholders and everybody has an idea of what now should happen. What we want to do is take all that amazing information and start to distill it into bite-sized chunks, bite-sized chunks. And uh, because- once you start getting the, those early things in place, you, you're going to have a hundred new ideas and you're going to start to realize what you didn't even know. And, and if you're locked into this two year complex build I know. and have never done this before, right. you, you know, you're going to, all of a sudden you're going to be on change orders, left, right, and center. And, and it's like for companies that have done this path before, okay. You know, they know what they're getting into yep. for people just starting out or dipping a toe or building on something very minimal. I know. Let's just take it to the next step. And we can tell you the next four look like, but you could also be going down this path. So, yeah. So let's go a little deeper into that comment, okay? okay? And this is going to be, okay, so I don't know whether this business had experience building e-commerce capabilities before. The people who have done it, they are going to be super conservative. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because they they know how hard it is. Okay, even though yeah, we yeah. talk about technology is easy, but it's still difficult. I mean, execution yeah. is hard. Any any executing anything is yeah. going to be hard, right? So here, right. let's dig a little deeper into what was the kind of stories that you got from the business when you were working with this client. You know, were they realistic? Were they not realistic? When uh, you know uh, what happened after that? Did you have to cut down the scope? When the, you got these stories, so what was the initial scope, if you remember? And then what all you know, what are your surprises? And you knew that, you know, this is sort of uh, not as much your client and you need to do a little bit of coaching in terms of managing their expectations, right? The great thing about this particular client was that uh, they had, we had worked with some of their team and another company. And so they, okay. they were, they were pretty well versed in our approach on these things. And so, but there were still, I mean, even a year later, we were tweaking order flow and, oh, and yeah. customer flow and, and make, making it easier and easier. We realized we had like 12 extra steps. I was 12, but a lot of extra steps in there didn't need to be there. And we're almost confusing the end consumer. And so, you know, just constantly staying I don't want to use the word agile because it's not it, it's it's not like every day you're doing it, right? but it is being let's say flexible, right? And really yeah. trying to always relearn what's going on. And and the market's always shifting anyway. So, you know, so that combined with what we did, maybe not ideal from day one when we thought about the business flow, right? You're always constantly massaging that model. I will say that with another company, another furniture company we worked with, fantastic company, well established, um, they were trying to go into this D to C area, direct to consumer okay. with some of their their product lines that were they were segregating their lines and so they had their high-end lines which were very much to their their commercial channels and but they wanted to sort of have a fighting line that could maybe be a little more direct to consumer interesting because they had the materials they had the experience they had the designs and and it made perfect sense um but what was interesting there is they were such a brand heavy company yeah that we would get into designs 
Yeah. And, and look, I love a great design as much as the next person, but there are some basics on UX and, and conversion rate optimization that, you know, anything more you spend on design is for ego and brand as opposed exactly. to necessarily driving sales. Right. And, and that can be okay. But yeah. we found ourselves, you know, in dis- these discussions with committees of people saying, I want to move that logo three pixels to the left, oh, right? Wow. And then we have to go through another <laughs> entire four weeks of new designs because you're talking about you've got to be a mobile tablet, desk, or, you know, I mean, it's oh, not like, you know, wow. every change, right, has to be redone across. A, and you're going, you know that this is not going to, you're never going to return on that investment, right? Exactly. And that may be okay. Some companies are very much, I mean, it yeah. is very visual. It is very much on brand. But we, again, for my my business hat, right, I'm... I'm always looking at bottom line. I want, you know, I want to make the biggest return on my investment in technology, yeah. particularly if it's a new technology or a new channel, and and then learn from that, right? And then maybe I can start playing around with that level of design. Maybe I don't know. I'm not sure. I ever personally, my own business has got that level, but um, but you know, it's a so that I we try to bring in the sense of if your business goal and there's always, I mean, when it comes to e-commerce, right? Either I'm trying to get new clients. Yeah. I'm trying to get a higher average order value or I'm trying to bring them back, right? I mean, yeah. really at the end of the day, I mean, you can get more nuanced than that, but it's not a lead gen site. It's not a brochure site. It's not a, it's not even for my sales reps, a sales enablement tool, right? It really, if I'm talking e-com, whether to my commercial clients or direct to consumer, those are one of those are my one of my three targets and some version of them, right? I'm always trying to say, is what you're trying to do here driving to one of those goals? And if it's not, that's okay, but just know that going in because it's going to impact budget time and everything else. So that's a... So that's a very interesting story. I really like that, to be honest, okay? And there is always going to be a little bit of conflict that as the consultant, you probably need to deal with. For example, this designer is obviously really passionate about their work and yeah, they want yeah. everything to be perfect, right? And yes, I, I get yes. it. I get it, right? Yeah. Because you yeah. know they really want to uh, be proud of their work and that's why they are doing yeah. all of this. But now you are going to talk to the CFO, okay? And I don't know who was acting as the CFO in this particular case. Most likely, VP of marketing is probably acting as the CFO because this yeah. poor person need to write the check, right? Yeah, and exactly. Why the ROI as well? And their job is hard, to be honest. It's not easy yeah. to justify the ROI. And many no. people are talking about, okay, three pixel, you know what? It costs $1,000 to build that. Do you still yeah, exactly, that? exactly. That's right. That's right. Like, like, not only are we going to do 20 new designs, but, you know, it, 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 I'll think of all the people that are involved, right? I mean, there is a cost with this. Maybe it's rounding error for some companies, but I, I even think, you know, your, your larger companies are operating on some tight budgets and this is, gets hard to rationalize sometimes. Um, we take it to a point, like I just had a great conversation this morning with a, a, a client of ours, uh, again, long established manufacturer. They said, we'll talk a little bit about how they're going to support their down market because they're, do- it's interesting. We'll talk about that second year. They, they uh, you know, we, we did some designs for them and they love them, but now their internal design team wants to take those and go and really enjoy it. Right. And, and do what we just talked about, really make it shine. Yeah. And I just, I just preemptively, you know, got on the call with uh, their executive team. And I said, look, Love it. Here's you are right now on time and budget. If you start doing one to one shifts, certainly you're probably in the same time and budget. Yeah. But we are. If, if your designers want to dream big, that's great. I just want you to know that you could end up inadvertently having a four x on time and four x on budget, and we can then work with you on where the eighty twenty rule is, or maybe this is important to you. And they appreciated that heads up because the 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 finance department was not necessarily realizing that, you know, yes, we're going to get these amazing designs out of our, our top-notch marketing department, yeah. but it's going to have a, a resulting cost associated with that, right? In his mind, he was still on this number we gave. And I said, you could be, you could just as easily be 3Xing that when we give you revised estimates. And that, and so we try to be pre, we try to make sure that all the stakeholders have that understanding, not just one stakeholder, because we we found this even in the best companies with the best communication, sometimes those moving parts get lost. So, yeah. And to be honest, I mean, you know, if you talk to really, really good UX person, they actually wear the business hat and they are very much after the conversion uh, rate optimization. And they, yes. uh, you know, think from that perspective that, okay, uh, you know, I'm doing all of this design for what? <laughs> right. Okay. Right. So they, yeah. They, well, that's UX. That's UX. That's not necessarily brand. Yeah. Right? That's like, yeah. And so yeah. brand yeah. designers, have a different hat on and they have to because they've been in catalog they've been particularly we're talking manufacturers and more traditional industries they've never done their amazing designs necessarily for web okay and so with the idea that we're always i mean every you you design this image for print you can use it across a wide variety of print media 
yeah. for designing online, I got to be thinking that it's got to work across multiple devices, multiple yeah. browsers. Yeah. I, I got to drive conversion. Yeah. And every change is going to have to be done eight times to work across all those devices and all those browsers. And, and don't forget ADA compliance and, and yeah. WCAG compliance. That's an entire other world. So when we do designs, we're thinking UX conversion rate, brand identity, but core values, not down to, you know, extraordinary. But then we're, we want to make sure the designs we give you are not going to land you in a heap of trouble with, you know, personal injury lawyers, you know, coming after you for uh, ADA compliance and WCAG disability compliance. And so, and that's a rising issue across the board right now. So, and it's another whole world because every change you do in design has to make sure it can still comply with all of those regulations. Well, Very interesting. So give us yeah. some brief bits about, you know, the people who might not know about ADA uh, compliance <laughs> from the design perspective. Uh, is it going to be out of the box? And I don't know which systems are we talking about. You know, is it going to be part of, let's say, Magento, Shopify, or uh, do you have to do something to enable that? You can. So, for example, we we built a core theme that is very customizable, very scalable, very fast, friendly, developer friendly, all those things. And it's ADA, WCAG compliant out of the box. What does that mean? Everything from uh, fonts are certain sizes relative to each other. Yeah. Colors are, have enough contrast between each other so that yeah. it, uh, people that are visually impaired can see them. Uh, the layout, the core architecture of the, of the elements underneath can be read by readers uh, for people who are visually impaired. Uh, they can be spoken aloud for people uh, well, or typed. Right, All these pieces that go in to allow anybody that might have a physical disability to be able to interact with the website. That's what the guidelines seek, seek to improve for everybody, okay? So out of the box, yes, we have a theme that does all that. But the minute you start changing anything, yeah. you kind of got to run it through the analysis again. Have you have you chosen a color now that no longer has enough contrast variance? Have you chosen a font that can't be easily read or deciphered? Have you, you, know, have you changed an element on the screen? So now when... A read, a hardware reader is telling you, you would expect that I'm going to choose this option and be able to add to cart. All of a sudden, it's reading you something that has to do with a product description. And really, it should have been going to cart. There's all these very complex technology pieces that have to come together, design yeah. and coding to ensure that you don't fall, fall, you know, fall below the compliance standard and risk a lawsuit, essentially, or bad PR, which is generally what the issue is. And do you know if there are any platforms that might be able to alert the users when they are probably going to be choosing incorrect well, fonts or the elements or these capabilities in you can, you can You can run your... your you can run your quick hit tools. Even Google has got quick hit tools. We run, we've got a few that we like that dive in a little bit deeper to at least give us an overview yeah. of, hey, here's where you're running a foul of these guidelines. But there's no one tool that can do all of it, right? I mean, still at the end of the day. So we actually invested in an ADA compliance officer on our design team years ago uh, in WCAG because it was that's European's guidelines, Europe's guidelines. And it was coming more into force there a few years ago. And now it's catching up here as well. Yeah. And so we've been, we've always been focused on that, but we're finding clients now are contacting us because, oh, uh, we just got a lawsuit handed to us because our site is not compliant. And it's a little bit like PCI compliance. It's a little bit like any yeah. security compliance you're doing, right? You're never going to be a hundred percent, but the key is you want to show that you are actively working toward it and you're, and you're documenting that process, at least from my perspective, I mean, I can't give legal advice, obviously, but I think that that is going to, you're not going to be the low hanging fruit. Okay. Yep. And so, uh, and so just even taking those things into consideration day one, when you're doing design is an important thing and documenting that because you're going to show, yeah, we, we do consider this. And so, but yeah, it's a, there's another whole world, you know, <laughs> that uh, everybody, whether you're a manufacturer or established consumer brand, everybody's having to deal with on the front end. So. Oh, this is so insightful, Robert. And I think we can go on for an hour, I guess, in this discussion. I, we'll yeah, still not, right? I mean, this is so much. Oh fun. my God. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We are close to our time. Do you have any closing advice for our listeners? I think for manufacturers, and I, I just had this great call today with another one of our manufacturing clients, and they're they're looking and saying, we're not going to do necessarily D to C, but we're going to take every one of our, even our smaller mom and pop type retailers, and we're going to build them up. We're going to give them the ability to yeah. sell online, and we're going to, and then we're going to build that cohesion, right, uh, between our, our our two organizations, and. I love that because we've helped other clients do that as well with their their channels and and providing more of a vertical solution. And so I think that those are ways you can start thinking about yeah. leveraging your core product data. You companies have this product data that and and they know how to manufacture it and supply it. That is the goal, right? Take that and leverage it fully. 
crawl, walk, run. I think those are my two final points. <laughs> okay, amazing insights. And my personal takeaway from this conversation yeah. is going to be, if you are going to be a furniture manufacturer, obviously there are tremendous opportunities out there for the customer experience. So make sure you are at least understanding them, what can be done and make sure you are following all of the guidelines such as ADA yeah. to make sure you are not going to get into trouble. On that note, Robert, I want to thank you for your time. This has been a powerful episode. I really appreciate it. And, and Sam, if anybody wants to continue the conversation, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to even answer questions. You know, I love the conversation. So thanks for being super kind, Robert. Thank you. Take care. You don't thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Robert, head over to ironplane.com forward slash about hyphen us. It's I-R-O-N-P-L-A-N-E dot com forward slash A-B-O-U-T hyphen us. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Jacqueline Laufer, who shares her insights into the Shopify pause and the challenges associated with international payments. Also, the interview with Colin Cronin, who shares his insights into the evolution of B2B digital commerce capabilities for a global medical device manufacturer. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Respect the Word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.